Hello, 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 everyone out there on Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. Thank you all so much for tuning in for today's episode of Echo Live, which I'm calling the future of fuels. I can see a couple of friends still starting to join in. If you're still getting situated, go ahead, sit down, get comfortable for today's exciting program. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat wherever you are tuning in from. Send me a message in the chat telling me that you're here, that you're watching. You can tell me where you're watching from. Um, I always love to see who we're connecting with and where they are connecting from. So if you are from a different city, a different state, even a different country, let us know in the chat. Um, and you can also tell us something that you think you might learn about as well. So we are gonna get started with today's program. Um, as I can see a couple friends and familiar faces starting to tune in in the chat. Hi to Shannon. Very excited to see what we might talk about today. Hello to our friends right here inside Zoom. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Jen from Romulus, good to have you. All right, now we said that today's program we are calling the future of fuels. So now that we've had a moment to answer my first question of the day in the chat, let's talk about my next one. My next question for you all is, can you name me an example of a fuel or somewhere where we get fuel from? So think about all the different types of things that need fuel, first of all, and then think about how they use things as fuel. Um, if you've tuned in for a past episode where I've lit anything on fire, right? Fire is one of those processes that needs a fuel. So you've seen me use things like alcohol for fuel. You've seen me light paper on fire. Even metals are good examples of fuel for combustion reactions. But we can use other things as sources of fuel as well. So think about what types of things we can use to power up our homes, power up our cities, drive our cars. There are lots of good answers to this question. Hmm, Alyssa on Facebook told us the sun and Jen in Zoom told us that we use the sun for solar power. Solar power is a fantastic source of fuel. That's a really great example because that one is pretty environmentally friendly as well. Don said that we can use gas, um, a few different types of gas, right? There's gasoline like we use in our car, um, but we also use a different kind of gas if you have a gas powered stove at home that it uses natural gas. These are great answers, everybody. Now let's dive in to a few more examples. So we can break cat fuels up into a few categories. I'm sure we've all heard them called things renewable versus non-renewable. Um, but I actually wanna talk about an even smaller category. I want to talk about biofuels and fossil fuels. One of those I'm sure sounds pretty familiar. Um, anyone ever heard of fossil fuels? If you've heard of fossil fuels, you can give me a thumbs up on whatever platform you are joining in on. Um, fossil fuels are made of fossils and we've done a whole episode on fossils before. Um, but the newer one is we are also going to spend some time talking about biofuels. And if you've tuned in for a past episode, you know that I love biology because it is the study of life or living things. Um, and so you can probably figure out or guess what are some examples of biofuels. So let's talk through some of these examples. If I change my background here to our first fuel source, this is what a coal plant looks like. Now, coal is one of those examples of a fossil fuel. To tell you a little bit about how coal is used as a fuel, it is made out of organic material or biological material on um, things like plants, leaves, bark, um, wood. All of that can be turned into coal, but for that to happen, that um, organic material has to be buried for millions of years first. Um, coal is one of America's largest produced energy sources. So um, we dig up a lot of coal, we process a lot of coal like you see in these plants behind me. Um, and that's one of America's biggest exports. 
Um, and we use that coal to burn and then turn into electricity, which can power up our homes, our science centers, and even our cars. Um, but burning coal releases carbon, which you can also see behind me. Um, burning coal releases carbon, combines in the oxygen uh, with the oxygen in the atmosphere, um, and it can cause quite a bit of pollution. Um, they tell us that one pound or 100 pounds of coal is about equivalent to one tank of refined gasoline. And gasoline is another example of a fossil fuel. Now I'm giving you all these examples because we're going to play a game a little bit later on. So think about these examples as I tell you them. Think about which energy sources sound good to you and which of them sound like they're not so good. And I'll try to give you some pros and cons of both. Let's talk about our next fuel source. So if I change my virtual background here, this one we've actually talked about a little bit. This probably looks kind of familiar. What do I have behind me but natural gas? And natural gas is another example of a fossil fuel. Natural gas is also made out of plants and animals, um, mainly marine plants and animals, meaning animals and plants that come out of the ocean or our seas. Um, but those animals, just like coal, died millions of years ago. And over lots of time and under lots of pressure have been turned into what we now use as natural gas. Um, fun fact for you all, in 2015, the US consumed 27,000 billion cubic feet of natural gas. So number so big that we had to put it in thousands and then billion cubic feet. Um, and that is a lot. It made up about 27% of our total energy consumption that year in 2015. Um, natural gas releases 45% less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than coal did and about 30% less than oil, traditional oil, um, which we also can call gasoline. Now, um, electric power, so the power companies like if you live in our area, uh, DTE, um, those are the biggest users of natural gas. Um, if you've ever seen a DTE truck driving down the road, um, those DTE trucks actually use natural gas instead of gasoline. So instead of driving up to a fuel pump and pumping it full of liquid gasoline like we might use um, in our cars, um, the Science Center also has a vehicle like DTE that is full of natural gas. Um, so it is a good fuel source. Um, it's pretty common around where we live, um, but definitely still some environmental implications to natural gas as well. Let's talk about another example of a fossil fuel. Let's talk next about oil. Right now, we're pretty familiar with oil. Um, and this picture that I have behind me is an example of an oil rig. Um, so actually a lot of the oil that we drill for comes from oil rigs that are stationed way far out in the ocean um, or up near the polar ice caps. Um, there are lots of oil reserves, but they are deep underground. And so we have to drill a long, long way for us to get there. Just like natural gas, um, obviously this oil is mostly made out of fossilized marine plants and animals. So plants and animals that died in the oceans uh, many, many millions of years ago. Um, and we actually find it in a liquid form underground. So the oil rig behind me drills down until it finds oil. And then we collect that oil and ship it off to various parts of the world. Um, we can turn this gas into um, traditional gasoline. We can use it as diesel fuel. We can turn it into jet fuel. And we can also turn this type of crude oil into asphalt, which we use to um, create roads and uh, other streetways. Um, so a barrel of crude oil, um, one barrel of crude oil makes about 45 gallons of petroleum. And in 2015, we used over 95 million barrels of, um, crude, of petroleum oil every single day. 95 million barrels every single day. That's a lot, right? Now let's talk about a few examples of biofuels. Um, and like we said, the first three fuels are coal, our natural gas, and our oil. These were all made for um, from living things as well. They all came from living creatures that have been fossilized. Um, but let's talk about some different types of fuels, our biofuels, which we are not calling fossil fuels. The first one I want to talk about is 
ethanol. Now, ethanol is not just um, good for burning like you've seen me do with our whoosh bottle experiment during Kaboomistry or any of our other fire episodes, but ethanol is actually another fantastic source of fuel for things like cars. Ethanol is made out of sugars that we find in grains and we can use things like corn or barley or rice and even potato skins can be refined and then turned into ethanol fuel. Um, we used about 14 billion, gallon, gal, uh, 14 billion gallons of ethanol in 2015, so much, much less than all of the other fuel sources we've talked about so far. It's not because it's not available, um, but keep in mind how much we've used so far. Um, actually, Henry Ford's Model T, so if you're from Detroit and you're familiar with Henry Ford, or really if you're anywhere and you're familiar with Henry Ford, his first car, the Model T, actually did run on a mixture of gasoline and ethanol. So this technology isn't necessarily new. Um, we've known that ethanol is a good fuel source for a very long time. And it was also a good source of lighting fuel for lanterns during the Civil War. Uh, mainly here in the US, we use corn, like you see in the fields behind me. Um, and corn is one of our biggest crops that's grown to be turned into ethanol fuel. Um, if you're from the Midwest, you've probably seen fields and fields of corn if you've ever taken a drive um, down the freeway, um, a little bit further away from the city. Um, and a lot of that corn that you see being grown is actually not for eating, even though corn is delicious. It's actually specifically grown so that we can turn it into uh, ethanol fuel. All right, let's talk about another one. And this one is one of my favorites. Does anyone know that we can, oh, I need to pick un momento. Does anyone know that we can turn cows into fuel? Now, I don't mean that we're gonna chop up these cows and turn them into fuel that way, um, but does anyone know what from cows we can turn into fuel? This one I think a few people might know. It's one of my favorites because it's a little bit funny, maybe a little bit of a bathroom joke. Anyone especially maybe out there in Mrs. Worth's classroom? What can we take from cows and turn into fuel? It's a little gross, maybe a little bit smelly, but we can actually take what we call methane and turn that into fuel. You guessed it. Uh, biomethane actually comes from the farts and from the belches or burps that come from cattle. Um, so there are lots of cows here in the US. Um, they're here for dairy. They're here for the meat market. Um, but we also raise cattle to be turned into biomethane. So we can actually take something that is the waste of a living creature, like a cow, um, or humans make biomethane as well. And we can actually turn that in to fuel to power up our homes, our cities, and our cars. Um, the Detroit Zoo, just up the road from where we are, they actually have what they call an anaerobic digester, um, which is a system that's able to convert 400 tons of animal manure um, or waste or scat, as one might call it in the nature world. Um, and they actually process that and they turn it into renewable energy to power up the zoo's um, animal hospital, which is pretty cool, right? It's something that, of course, being at the zoo, they've got lots of large animals, elephants, rhinos, and so they've got a lot of scat to deal with, right? And they've found a way to turn that waste into something that they can use again. And for something really important, right? Just like their animal hospital. Um, so capturing all of that methane gas um, is also a good thing for the environment because not only are we using it again, but we're also keeping those gases, which if this were a coal plant, right? And that those harmful gases were escaping into our atmosphere. Now we're taking that and we're keeping it, we're using it. And so that is not being let go into our atmosphere. And so we're cutting down on pollution. Interesting fun fact. Now, the last one is probably the least conventional and probably one of the least known of the fuels that we've talked about so far. This is what we call an algae farm. And algae grows in the ocean, much like what we talked about with some of our other examples. Now, farmers, just like a farmer might grow a crop like corn or flowers, um, they can actually grow algae, um, which is a marine organism, and they can turn it into fuel as well. 
algae is very interesting because unlike the other ones, we aren't going to burn algae. So we're not actually taking the algae, lighting it on fire or burning it in order to convert that into energy for our various devices. Algae actually converts sunlight into energy itself. Um, so we process it um, and we can actually convert the energy from the sun through the algae and then from the algae into energy for our cars, trucks, trains, and planes. Um, and so it's a really interesting fuel source. It's definitely one of the lesser common um, fuel sources that we've talked about so far. Um, so what I'd like to do next is talk about um, what type of fuel sounds like the best option to you. Now, this is an opinion-based question. I really wanna know what you think. Um, so if you can't remember all of the various fuels that I've talked about so far, um, I'm gonna bring up a slide that has all six of our options. We talked about coal, natural gas, oil, ethanol, biomethane, or algae. So I'm curious to you all tuning in, if you were an investor, if you had money to invest in one of these types of fuels because you feel like it is going to be the best fuel, the best option for us oops, going forward, I'm curious for you to tell me where would you put your money? So take a moment to think about what we've talked about, some of the various pros and cons of these various fuel sources, and tell me in the chat if you had money to give or money to invest to grow one of these industries, which one would you give your money to? Hmm. Give you all just a moment to think. You know, this is a tricky question. If you maybe can't decide on just one, you're more than welcome to split your money as well. So if you think two of these are a good option, um, you can tell me that as well. Mrs. Worth's class um, has a few answers. So Jamie thinks algae and Atniel thinks natural gas. Both good answers, right? Like we said, there's no wrong answer to this exercise because this is what you think. This is where you would put your money if you had it. Shannon thinks algae, even though Shannon was definitely pretty excited about power farts earlier on. Um, let's see, lots of votes coming in for algae. Uh, maybe because like me, you love biology and you think algae is super interesting. Couple people saying ethanol, um, Elias saying biomethane, um, definitely T says coal. All right, um, so get in your answers for this first part of our exercise because I want to now change the game a little bit. You've told me where you would put your money. So if you were thinking with your own personal money that you're taking out of your wallet, you've told me where you would invest it. But my question for you is, would your answer change if you were a doctor? So think about what a doctor does and think about what doctors are concerned about. Would you change your answer if you were a doctor? Where would you invest now? So doctors usually consider things like the health repercussions, right? They think about um, the health of humans specifically, since this is a human doctor on my slide. Maybe your answer would be different if you were uh, an animal doctor. Um, but doctors are mainly concerned with the health of our human populations. So take a moment and think, if you were a doctor, would you invest your money differently? I know that if I was concerned um, or thinking about where to put my money if I was concerned about people's health, I might not want to choose some of the options like coal um, or natural gas or oil, those ones that release a lot of pollution into the air. Um, if I was an animal doctor, right, I might consider the health of some of the animals and things like our biomethane, but for now we're talking about human doctors. Um, Atniel says they would not change their answer, um, even though natural gas um, is definitely releases some pollution, it is definitely less um, than some of our other sources. So it could be okay to keep your answer. Um, Jaheem says, if you were a doctor, you would pick biomethane. Maybe that's because you love biology as a doctor too. Let's try another one. If you were the president, where might you invest your money? Now, this is if you were the president, right? So maybe your answer isn't super different. Um, because the president, right, they're here to protect the people who live in this country. 
their job is to think of what's best for the citizens of the US, but also to think about our economy. And sometimes those things don't go hand in hand, right? And so if you were the president, you might choose to invest in some of those bigger industries like coal, right? Because coal is something that keeps the American economy growing and keeps our economy healthy, um, even though it does some, have some negative implications for um, the environment or for sometimes human health. And that's what makes some of these jobs very difficult is um, needing to make compromises, needing to change your answer, right? Because of what your job is. So like I said, there are no wrong answers to any of these questions. Um, but one last one. What if you were an engineering student? So I'm sure we've got some future engineers out there. Um, this woman on this slide is actually studying petroleum engineering. Um, so they are learning how to build um, bigger, better, more efficient oil rigs or drilling systems. So if you were this engineering student, if you were this person here on the screen, a petroleum engineer, where would you invest your money now? A couple of people on the last one said they might change their answer for certain things. Atmiel said, I think for the president answer, right, that um, you might invest in ethanol because we've got lots of farms here in the US. I think that would be a fantastic decision. Atmiel, maybe you'll run for president one day and I can vote for you. So I agree, ethanol is a very interesting type of fuel. There are no wrong answers, right? But if you were a petroleum engineering student, your interest might be in protecting the oil industry, right? If that's your job is to create um, more efficient oil rigs and find um, oil beneath the ground, um, maybe you could make it so that it is better for the environment. Maybe you could make it so it doesn't pollute the environment, or maybe you could work to reduce the chance of things like oil spills. Um, but you would probably be more likely, right, to invest in something like oil if you are a petroleum engineering student. Um, so like we said, this is just an exercise in talking through some of these options, right? There is no right answer. I don't have the answer to any of these questions. Um, I can't tell you where to invest your money. I hope that you will do your own research if that's ever an option for you and you'll invest your money um, where you think it is best for you and for the planet Earth and for the other people who live where you live. Um, and for the other people who live in other parts of the world, right? We need to be thinking about all these factors as we design the future of some of these types of fuel. Now, the very last thing I wanted to talk about today is the activity that I have set up on my table. And this one does not have to do with a biofuel or a fossil fuel. This has to do with um, wind fuel, because wind is another example of something that we call a renewable energy. Unlike our biofuels and our fossil fuels, which are technically renewable, right? Um, we get an unlimited amount of wind. We don't have to dig it up from the ground. We don't have to grow it. We don't have to um, do anything besides collect it or harness it and then turn it into energy, things like electricity. Um, so this is a graph of all of the various energy sources that were consumed by the United States in 2019. Um, you can see that only 2% is geothermal, 9% is solar from the sun, like some of you pointed out. 22% is hydroelectric, so using flowing water to create electricity. 24% of it comes from the wind, which we're about to talk about. And then 43% of that comes from those biomasses, um, things like um, our biofuels that we talked about from burning wood, um, from biomass waste. Um, and then all of this though, together, everything we talked about up here, um, all of these make up only 11% of the entire energy consumption. The rest of it comes from those um, other energy sources. Um, so technically petroleum, can we get more of it? Sure, but it'll be millions and millions and millions of years, right? And so we don't like to call that renewable. Um, because we're going to run out of it in our lifetime if we continue to use as much petroleum as we do. Um, we will probably also run out of coal. We'll run out of natural gas. And so we need to get creative about using other sources of fuel that are considered to be more renewable and much more quickly. 
So here on my table, I've actually built my own wind turbine. And I just wanna show you just how easy it is, just how easy it would be for you to harness wind power and turn it into electrical energy, just like I'm about to do. All I have is a fan, um, which is plugged into the wall. And this is gonna simulate wind since I'm here in the echo studio. I know it might look like I'm out here on the algae farms, um, but this is going to create some wind, which I'm then going to collect using my wind turbine, which I have created using just some very inexpensive PVC, this plastic material, and I've attached just a spinning blade. Um, that is going to send an electrical signal down to my voltmeter, which I have down here in the front. And this voltmeter is going to measure just how much electricity I'm generating using this wind turbine. So if I focus my camera here, maybe if I stick my hand next to it for now, there we go. Um, right now, since there is no wind, the wind or my wind source, my fan is turned off. Right now, there is no power being generated. So we are reading 0, 0.00 volts. Let's go ahead and let's try our first pair or first type of turbine blades. Um, so I've made a couple different options here. And this one doesn't necessarily look like the wind turbines that we see if you're ever driving down the road and you see those big wind farms. Um, tell me what you know or what do you notice? What is different about this wind turbine compared to the wind turbines that you see outside? Um, so take a good look. Take a look at this, which I'm going to attach to my PVC turbine here. What is different about that turbine? So while you tell me your answers, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn on our wind or turn on our fan here. We'll start with just a small amount of wind, making sure we're pointing at our blades here. And it is moving, but some of you are starting to point out that real turbines or the wind turbines that we see outside usually have three blades, whereas this one only has two. Um, okay, so we're, number of blades is different. What else about it is different? Someone else is telling me, yes, that the shape of the blades is also different. Um, these ones are rectangular, whereas the ones you see outside are usually more of a triangle or look like um, the blades of an airplane. Oh, there we go, though. With just a little bit of maneuvering here, this turbine blade has started to spin. And let's take a look at how much energy we are creating. We are generating just from the power of the wind spinning my rectangular dual or two bladed fan. We're still generating over one volt of electricity. That's enough to power an LED, right? Could you imagine if I scaled up my turbine to about a thousand times its size, right? So even though this one doesn't look like the turbine blades that we see outside, it still works. Let's try another turbine blade here. Um, this one is my favorite. I have not yet had a chance to test it, but this one has three blades, um, but they're definitely not triangular. I attach some heart-shaped blades because maybe, maybe love is all you need, as the Beatles would tell us. Maybe that's all we need to generate electri electricity or wind power. So let me go ahead, attach our next turbine blades, and then turn on our fan. Let's see if this one works. Oh boy. Well, my turbines look like they almost want to tip my entire setup backwards. Can do a little bit of changing here, seeing if maybe rotating my blades a little bit helps them to collect the wind a little better. And maybe for just a moment, but my heart-shaped blades not doing a fantastic job here of collecting wind and turning it into energy. So um, although I think it looks pretty nice and maybe I might get an award for cutest turbine blade design, not super great for generating electricity. We're pretty much at a complete zero in terms of the voltage. It might hover just above as it twitches back and forth, but um, not necessarily the best turbine blade design. But I'm not ready to give up yet. Um, what I created last is of course more of a traditional wind turbine blade experience. Here I've got three blades. They are triangular. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna very slightly rotate my blades, just like the ones you would see outside. Um, almost like a pinwheel. So that should help them to collect the air, catch the air, um, and then also have good flow of air off of the blades. All important components of a good wind turbine design. Um, so let's go ahead, turn my fan back on. 
give it a go. Give it just a moment. We might need to adjust my blades ever so slightly. Let's try this, tilting them towards the sun or towards the wind here. And there she blows, right? Our turbine is going, it's going, it's going, it's spinning. And let's take a look at our voltmeter here. Not quite as good as our first design, um, but I wanna talk about why that might be the case. Now, trust me, engineers have done their job. I'm sure they've considered um, rectangular blades instead of these triangular blades like I have attached right now. Um, but a big factor that contributed to this one working so well is the size. Now, there's a lot more surface area on my first set of blades that I used, a lot more area to catch the wind and be affected by the wind and then turn the blade. I'm sure with a little bit more um, turning and spinning, I could get this one to put out just as much power. Um, but I bring this up to show you that this is a constant thing that engineers are working on. We're always re-engineering, we're always redesigning, and no one's to say that the way wind turbines look right now is the best way. So if you are interested in engineering um, and you're interested in physics and especially things like energy, um, you can definitely look into becoming the engineers who help to shape what the future of these wind turbines look like. All right, we are just about out of time for today's episode. If you have any questions, as always, please, please, please type them in the chat. I would be happy to answer a few of those before we head out for the day. This is a great part, um, time as always to thank the sponsors of Echo Live, Ford and Denso, who have allowed us to bring you these programs um, on Facebook, YouTube, and in Zoom um, for almost the entire past year. Um, we definitely hope we'll see you back here next time. Um, we will be bringing you a mini-sode next week, so a little bit shorter of a program, and we'll be featuring an activity or a science trick that you can try at home. So stick around, stay tuned, and we hope we'll see you back here again very soon. No questions coming in just yet, um, but if you're interested in learning more, definitely check out the Michigan Science Center's website. Um, we've got all sorts of programs, videos, science experiments that you can try with your class. Um, but if there's no questions before we head out for the day, oh, Anthony asked a great question from Miss Ward's class. Can you get energy from a storm? And the answer is absolutely, right? Storms are a fantastic source of wind. Now, storms are caused by a variety of factors, high and uh, low pressure zones, meeting, pushing, spinning, and creating wind, right? We can harness. We can turn it into energy just like we see here with this experiment. Um, we haven't yet figured out how to harness electricity from things like lightning strikes, um, but if you're interested in designing the future of energy, I'm not ruling it out. Maybe you can be the one that figures it out for us. Oh, Jamie asked, why didn't my heart-shaped fans work? Um, and I think there's a few reasons why. Um, number one, they're pretty small, right? And so the turbine itself is actually very, very heavy. Real turbines that you see outside weigh thousands and thousands of pounds. Even each blade weighs thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, these definitely do not, they're much smaller, but these need to be able to catch enough wind to move the weight of this turbine. And I think my hearts are just a little bit too small and maybe the shape isn't so great for pushing and directing the wind as it flows past it, that it's just not enough. Maybe if they were a little bit bigger, um, maybe it would have worked. Um, but that's part of the engineering design process, right? Is I've identified some things that I might like to change. And if I were a good engineer, which I like to consider myself to be, I might take this one apart, make some bigger hearts and try it again. And if that doesn't work, maybe I'll pick a different variable. Maybe it's the shape. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the number, right? Maybe if I had only two, or maybe if I had six turbines attached to this one, maybe it would work much better, but I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna keep designing until I get the maximum amount of energy out of our voltmeter here. Good question. All right, everyone. Thank you again so much for tuning in. Thank you to all those friends joining us in Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. I hope I'll see you back here next time for another episode of Echo Live.